This time on Superstars, five high flyers who've won major awards by getting down and dirty in the desert. The news that 28-year-old Australian actor Heath Ledger lay dead on the floor of a New York apartment was leaked so fast that by the time his body was wheeled out to the coroner's van, the scene was crawling with gawkers and paparazzi. Two weeks later, when the medical examiner declared his death had been caused by an accidental overdose of sleeping pills and antidepressants, his peers struggled to make sense of the loss of a young star who'd appeared to have everything to live for. Well, my heart goes out to his family and this kid. He's got a little kid. I don't know. Uh, you know, people have demons. Sometimes it's hard to see them. Whatever demons Heath Ledger may have been battling, he'd made no secret of the fact that his recently completed roles in The Dark Knight and I'm Not There had left him unable to switch off and sleep. In an interview with the New York Times just two months before his death, he claimed he was getting no more than two hours sleep a night and was heavily reliant on sedatives to get any rest at all. There were also rumors that the strain of playing the psychotic Joker in the Batman sequel had taken its toll on his mental state. Although in interviews about the film, he was upbeat about the experience, if not the character. It, it's just been stupid amounts of fun. And, um, you know, he's, he's incredibly, he's dark, yeah, very nasty. He's a psychopath, sociopath, mass murdering clown. But then Heath had always been drawn to the darker side of life. At a press conference for I'm Not There, in which he starred as Bob Dylan, he spoke of his fascination with a young singer-songwriter who had suffered from depression. Um, for the longest time, I was obsessed with an artist by the name of Nick Drake. He died in the 70s, 1975, at the age of 25. Suicide. Um, and I was uh, obsessed with his story and his music, and I pursued it for a while, and still have, still have hopes to kind of tell his story one day. In fact, Heath ended up making and appearing in a video clip to Drake's song Black Eyed Dog, a term for depression, coined by former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Throughout his meteoric rise to stardom that began in 1999 with 10 Things I Hate About You, the boy from Perth never seemed comfortable with fame. His attempts to protect his privacy led to early clashes with the clamoring paparazzi and claims that he was often abusive and even violent towards the press. In 2005 in Sydney, at the premiere of Brokeback Mountain, one paparazzo got their own back by spraying him with a water pistol. Another source of great unease for the young actor was talk of awards. All the fuss made over his multi-nominated performance as a repressed homosexual cowboy in Brokeback Mountain left him squirming on the red carpet. And despite being honored by the accolades, he didn't see acting as a competitive sport. It doesn't personally mean anything to me. Um, to my career, it just, it just means that there are uh, uh, hopefully interesting directors to work with and, and better scripts, better stories, uh, more challenges ahead. For Heath, clearly it was never about the fame, fortune or awards but simply the love of acting and the opportunity to keep improving as an artist. I guess I still feel like I'm breaking through. And I, me personally, I don't think I ever want to feel like I have broken through and are on the other side. I want to continue to strive for better. And... If anyone could persuade an old man... In an interview to promote his 2003 film, Ned Kelly, he explained his dread of becoming an A-list star. Uh, the couples have been giving her a hard time. Yeah, and once you're on top, there's only one way, one place to go. So I don't really want to be there. And um, I don't know, I'm not that ambitious. I don't really want to go out and buy skyscrapers. So I'm not, you know, uh, looking for that kind of career. Looking for it or not, that kind of career quickly found him. And after countless premieres and awards nights, he never seemed at home on the red carpet. The tragic irony of his young life came full circle, as even in death, he was unable to escape the invasion of the press and glare of the spotlight.
I think we're looking at more than one fracas. The Mexican brown dog. As disillusioned oh, Sheriff Ed Tom Bell in No Country for Old Men, and Tommy Lee different. Jones ponders our fruitless you know, search for the meaning of life possible. as he heads towards well-earned retirement. You don't believe it. <laughs> no. Despairing at the rising levels of lawlessness in West Texas in 1980, he attempts to beat a sociopathic assassin in a race to retrieve $2 million in drug money from an opportunistic thief. Despite the extreme violence and gripping suspense, Tommy Lee hoped audiences would see the film's funny side. Humor is the engine that, that, that keeps it going, and this is a very funny movie. It's not only just bleak or dark, it's also very funny, and that's important. Um, when you come to the end of it and, and, and you're invited to contemplate the idea of hope, um, you don't want to forget to laugh. While no country for old men's humor may have been buried beneath its bleak and depraved you know, veneer, the laughs in Men in Black couldn't have been more up front. Ah, good plan. Wait, wait, man, what you doing? The science fiction comedy action film in 1997 paired Tommy Lee with Will Smith as top secret agents who confiscate new technology from aliens. The story goes that the part of Will's grizzled and humorless mentor, Agent K, was originally turned down by Clint Eastwood, and that Tommy Lee was only tempted to accept it after producer Steven Spielberg promised that the script would improve. Angelina! Why didn't you get him off and escort all non-essential civilian personnel from this side immediately? Yes, sir. Listen to yourself, Kay. The hilarious like special effects and magic chemistry between Tommy Lee and Will helped the movie to worldwide takings of over half a billion dollars. Oh, I remember, I remember. Tommy Lee's start in films came way back in 1970 in Love Story. Although he only played a supporting role in the film, legend has it that the book's author, Eric Siegel, actually based his lead character on Tommy Lee and his Harvard roommate, Al Gore. He went on to enjoy moderate success in TV and films over the next 20 years. But it wasn't until the 90s that his career went into overdrive, with blockbusters like Batman Forever, Men in Black, and also The Fugitive, which won him an Academy Award. In 2003, his reputation for playing hard-bitten, straight-talking tough men led Ron Howard to cast him in the role of Kate Blanchett's estranged father in his suspense thriller The Missing. Mexico. After abandoning his family to live with the Apaches, Samuel Jones returns to find his wife long dead and his granddaughter kidnapped by a psychopathic killer. A part-time cattle farmer in real life, Tommy Lee owns a 3,000-acre ranch in San Antonio, Texas, and he's stuck with familiar territory in his 2005 directorial debut. The film, Three Burials, tells the tale of a Texas ranch foreman who kidnaps a border patrolman and highlights the social contrasts of life either side of the Rio Grande River. It came about after a conversation between Tommy Lee and screenwriter Guillermo Arriaga. I told him about a kid who had been shot dead right on the border by the United States Marine Corps. He was guarding his father's goats. He had a 22 rifle with him to protect the goats against coyotes. He shot at a coyote, and the Marines who were in camouflage staked out, supposedly watching for drug traffickers. Uh, panic decided that they were taking fire from drug dealers and shot the kid down and then got away with it. They were taken away by the government. and Nobody was ever held accountable for this child's murder. Son. My son's in a rack. Back in front of the camera two years later for In the Valley of Ella, Tommy Lee was just as passionate about tackling important social issues. The film was written and directed by Paul Haggis and examines the fate of young soldiers upon their return from the war in Iraq. Hold up drunks, twiddle your thumbs, not ask too many questions, but Tommy Lee's son. role as a military police officer searching for his missing son earned him a nomination for Best Actor at the 2007 Academy Awards. The actor who ended up winning the award was Daniel Day-Lewis, who'd emerged the bookie's firm favourite 
for his betrayal of the murderous Daniel Plainview in There Will Be Blood. I'm an oil man, you will agree. But Daniel tried not to buy into the hype. Family business. Really relaxed, incredibly nervous. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's horrible. Re really nervous, but actually pretending to be relaxed. Um, <laughs> or in some cases, incredibly... Um, relaxed and pretending to be nervous. But uh, in, in my case, I'm just going to turn up and see what happens. Um, and I will really, really try and enjoy it. <laughs> Winning the award was a remarkable achievement for an actor who's made just three movies in the last 10 years. But then Daniel is well known for being one of the most selective actors in the business. He's just as renowned for the fanatical dedication he applies to the projects that meet with his approval tells of his obsession with method acting have made him a legend in his own lifetime. During filming of My Left Foot in 1989, for instance, Daniel was said to be so immersed in his Oscar-winning portrayal of cerebral palsy victim Christy Brown that he refused to come out of character, insisting on being lifted over scenery and pushed around the set in his wheelchair. He also allegedly broke two ribs as a result of spending many weeks permanently hunched over. Similar stories of his onset obsessions have followed him throughout his career, but Daniel is keen to dispel them as myth. Could I, could I, I'd love, I know it's like asking the impossible, but if you could all begin by expunging from your minds anything that you've ever read in any other articles about me, let's start with a clean slate. I'm happy to try and answer any question, but so much hogwash has been written about about the way in which I, I do my work, that I'm, I'm less inclined than ever to actually talk about it because I feel that, uh, that anything I say just is like throwing petrol on the flames. While rumours of his eccentricities may not all be based in truth, his career path has certainly been unorthodox. The son of a British poet laureate and a Jewish actress, Daniel excelled at acting at school and made his film debut in Sunday Bloody Sunday at the age of 14. But despite winning rave reviews for his performances at the National Youth Theatre, he chose to take up cabinet making and only went to drama school when he was knocked back as an apprentice. One of the most notable roles of his early film career was as one half of a biracial gay couple in My Beautiful Laundrette. He then went on to star in The Unbearable Lightness of Being, The Last of the Mohicans and In the Name of the Father. In the late 90s, he retired from acting and moved to Florence to rekindle his passion for woodwork. Five years later, after months of coercion from Martin Scorsese, he agreed to star in his violent epic, Gangs of New York. Whoopsie daisy! I'm very, very glad that I did it. I mean, I was certainly in... Uh, it wasn't without a sense of dread that I approached it because uh, I knew it was going to be a tough thing to do. But it was no, no one can, I mean, Martin doesn't have to convince me about anything, obviously. He doesn't have to sell me anything. Um, that, that was, that went without saying when he asked me. I just needed to know for my own sake and for his as well, that if I went into the tunnel with him, I wouldn't be looking for the escape hatch. Perhaps part of the reason he'd taken so much time out was to enjoy life with his new wife, Rebecca Miller, who he met after working with her father, the famous playwright Arthur Miller. In 2004, they decided to work together on a film written and directed by Rebecca. Sadly, her father died just five days before The Ballad of Jack Rose screened at Cannes the following year. And Daniel was emotional. Quite apart from being uh, a supremely gifted storyteller, she's a magnificent woman, um, and her father was so proud of her. This just came to our dressing room for you. Gina Davis's big screen debut came in 1982, after director Sidney Pollack spotted her working as a model in New York. He cast her as a soap opera actress in his Oscar-winning comedy Tootsie, purely on the strength of her looks and height. It was all the leverage she needed to launch a successful career in acting. 
Over the next few years, Gina starred in a television series called Buffalo Bill, before landing her first major movie role opposite Jeff Goldblum in David Cronenberg's The Fly. Despite the gory subject matter and Jeff's less than appealing appearance as the mutant professor, she fell in love and they went on to marry in 1987, just as Gina's career was reaching its peak. In 1988, she won a Best Supporting Actress Oscar in Accidental Tourist. Two years later, Ridley Scott cast her as a passive, goofy housewife with a controlling husband in the unorthodox road movie Thelma and Louise. On a weekend getaway with her waitress buddy, she gets into a world of trouble at a bar and dance hall in Oklahoma. Louise ends up killing a potential rapist and the pair are forced to head to Mexico across the desert on the run from police. By turns hilarious and tragic, Thelma's transformation from doormat to desperado earned Gina another Academy Award nomination and confirmed her ability to play tough as well as kooky. And by 1996, for the film she also co-produced with her then-husband Rennie Harlin, she turned herself into a full-blooded action hero. In the thriller Long Kiss Goodnight, her life as a suburban mother and schoolteacher is shattered by the revelation that she is actually a CIA assassin suffering from amnesia. Okay, let's say I buy it. You are a trained killer. <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight face. She proved she was also a woman of action off the screen by reaching the semi-final qualifiers for the United States Olympic archery team at the age of 43. After her divorce from Rennie and subsequent marriage to Reza Jarahi, Gina took a few years out from acting to concentrate on raising a family. At the age of 46, she gave birth to her first child. Two years later, she had fraternal twin sons. In 2005, she made her small screen comeback in the ABC series Commander-in-Chief. The drama followed the fictional trials and triumphs of the first female president of the US and won Gina a Golden Globe Award, as well as an Emmy nomination. I, Mackenzie S. Allen, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. Aside from the industry accolades, she was pleased with the impact the series had on viewers. I saw a, a study that showed people that are familiar with the show are now 58% more likely to vote for a female candidate for president. So it's pretty amazing. I mean, I sort of guessed that we were having an impact, but it's pretty special to know that we did. Still, she believed there was a lot more work to be done to help women play a more prominent role in politics. There's actually uh, great qualified women out there, and I think we just have to keep getting more women interested in politics and coming up in the ranks. We, you know, we're only 14% uh, of Congress is women, so we need, to, we need to get that number up. Only eight of our 50 governors are women, so. And Gina is certainly doing her part. Her contribution to women in entertainment was acknowledged with a Lucy Award. The fact that it's from women, you know, and, and women in film, especially an organization that I have tremendous respect for, it's really meaningful to me. I mean, I, I've always cared a great deal about women's images in the media, in, in large part for selfish reasons, because I want to have really good roles. and. Uh, and so to now be recognized by them as someone who's had some impact, it means a lot to me. When Javier Bardem became the first Spaniard to win an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, the folks back home were ecstatic. I think it is great news. Good for Spain, for Spanish cinema, and for the Spanish as a whole not just him. As Javier was dedicating his award to his mother Pilar in Spanish over in LA, at the Bardem family restaurant in Madrid, his actor sister Monica was toasting his success. How are you? 
This is a personal achievement for Javier, an achievement that he chose to share with his fellow actors and dedicate to Spain. I feel proud of him because he has reached a high point neither him nor us thought he was going to reach. I'm very happy for him, but I see it as something for himself, personal. The 37-year-old actor's bone-chilling turn as a cold-blooded assassin in No Country for Old Men also won him a Golden Globe and a Screen Actors Guild Award. Call it. Call it, yes. For what? Just call it. Well, we need to know what we're calling it for here. You need to call it. I can't call it for you. Well, it wouldn't be fair. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. The native of Gran Canaria has been stringing together a diverse and impressive body of work since landing his international breakthrough role in Before Night Falls. In his very first English-speaking part, his portrayal of gay Cuban poet and novelist Ronaldo Arenas won him an Academy Award nomination. Four years later, he carried off the Best Actor Award at the Venice Film Festival for his role in The Sea Inside. The film by Alejandro Amenobar told the true story of a Spanish sailor left paralyzed from the neck down after a diving accident. And his 30-year fight to die with dignity was born with humor and wit. I did put my sense of humor into the character, which he was very close to his humor. That's why I decided that maybe mine would work. Because uh, it's a kind of ironic, painful kind of humor. And I like that, actually. So he asked me, OK, man, relax and try to get his humor, because it's important, because we're talking about a man who's asking for his right to die with dignified, but at the same time, the way he's expressing that emotion or that wish is through, the, through a huge smile. Unfazed by the challenge of carrying the entire film without being able to move, Javier found the key to portraying the quadriplegic euthanasia activist. Because when, when you're making an action, you don't need to move. Uh, I want something from you and I am trying to act my need of getting it. And I do it through my voice. So we are doing it, that everything, that every day in our lives without moving. So it's not that difficult. It's about being relaxed and just being focused on what that person is saying and why he's saying that thing. You want a job in the river? In 2007, he starred in an adaptation of the Gabriel Garcia Marquez novel, Love in the Time of Cholera. It was the first time that a non-Spanish director has ever taken on the task of adapting the Nobel Prize winner's work to the big screen. But while it may have been breaking new ground for Mike Newell, Javier was no stranger to the Colombian novelist's work. Well, I was 14 years old when I read the book first, <clears throat> when I first read the book, and it was quite young to understand the whole uh, landscape that Garcia Marquez uh, explaining there. But uh, what took me to the project is the fact that the adaptation was very, I don't know, faithful to the, uh, to the flavor of the novel, to the, to the essence of the novel. Love in the Brown Time of Cholera is. follows the struggles of Florentina Ariza to win the heart of Fermina Daza. It takes the hero 51 years, nine months and four days, but he wins her in the end. Not here. From the role of die-hard romantic hero, Javier steps straight into the boots of cattle gun killer Anton Chigur in the Coen brothers' thriller No Country for Old Men. Just to prove there is no end to his versatility, he's currently filming a Woody Allen film in Spain before embarking on a musical with Penelope Cruz.